What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Culture Base Podcast. I'm Dustin. He's Blake. And we're ready for another great episode today. Uh, releasing this on October 17th, halfway through October already. Hopefully you've got your Halloween costume all picked out and your trick-or-treat candy stocked up, ready to go. But today we're going to talk about the teenagers that come to your door on Halloween and what to do about that. I'm just kidding. That's not what we're talking about. Sort of. Prepared. Sort of in a round of way. Sort of. Sort of. Uh, today we're going to be talking about dealing with difficult people. Mm. Cannot wait to get into because those are my favorite kind of people. Mm. The real oh. low lives. I'm I don't just kidding. think that's true at all. Nah, it's not. I uh, want to remind you we're here to help leaders know what they're about, show where they're going, and develop a scalable team to get them there. You can follow along with everything that we release on the socials at the culture base, B A S E at the end. Uh, or you can follow us as well and learn more about how we can help you or your organization at theculturebase.com. Go there for your free 30 minute strategy session on how we can help you know what you're about, show where you're going, and develop, develop a scalable team to get you where you're going. Mm. Helping that. Yeah. We'd love to you know, if we if we had a cooking show, I think we should be called the culture based. Mm. I like that. Yeah. So I like that. band name called it. Yeah. Oh God. Beat me to it. All right. Mm. Cooking Joe name called it. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> he the forgot difficult to call people. Is that what we're talking about today? He he forgot the he forgot the the one thing. Anyway. Yeah, we're talking about difficult people. But um yeah, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn. We talked about that. We talked about culturebase.com. If you're listening on an audio podcast platform, we're sad we can't look at you uh, in your, your face. Now. But we're so glad that you're listening, and we would love for you to leave a five-star review. helps the content go further and reach a bigger audience for those who may need it. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, hello there. Good to see you. Uh, we'd love for you to hit the like, subscribe, and ring the bell buttons. It's a three action in one move. Um, don't take your hands off the mouse. Just click them, bam, bam, bam. Pew, pew, pew. Uh, just like a little animation just showed you on the screen. So... Uh, but yeah, Blake, today we're going to talk about some difficult peeps. Nice. We all work with them. We all got them. We all know that we don't have to be best friends with everyone at work. Um, but we do know that a healthy relationship is key. And so today we're going to ask, how do you deal with those people on your team, Blake, that are just plain difficult? Yeah, this, I mean, and this takes us to the question, should you have difficult people on your team? Right? Like, is it? Like, think about it. The whole thing we're doing here is trying to create the perfect team. And why would you have difficult people on your team? And shouldn't that be eradicated from what your team looks like because everything should just be great? I don't know. I don't think so. And I think that's where we need to start digging into because I think there's an assumption that the best way to have the best team is to get the difficult out. And I don't agree yeah. with that. I think yeah. there is something more. Yeah, I think there's definitely something there to look into. I think a lot of people are trying to figure out, well, uh, uh, if I have a difficult person on my team, you know, we're just going to let them go. We're not going to really kind of work through it. We're just going to mm -hmm. kind of take the easy road out. And that doesn't really build any character. It doesn't really build any good team culture. It's mm -hmm. just a culture of dumping people by the side of the road. But, you know, some people, like you said, they don't even think they have difficult people on their team. But there was a, a study recently, uh, Psychology Today posted about this. They said in a, in a new study in the american sociological review called difficult people who is perceived to be demanding in personal networks and why are they there three quarters of young adults so if you don't know three quarters at 75 percent, and two-thirds of older adults which is 67 percent, named at least one person in their life who was difficult or demanding so nice. that should let you know that we kind of for the most part most of us have at least one person in our life. And because we spend a good portion of our lives at work or in a work environment digitally, the odds are that these difficult people that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis are on your team. So let's mm -hmm. talk about how to deal with these difficult people on your team. And the one way that we wanted to do that for you today was to just simply provide some filters. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, there's a difficult person on my team. 
it's, it's kind of a you know, you seen those flow charts, the if then charts, like yeah. if you know, are you hungry? Uh, yes, then yeah. get something. No, then go back to bed. You know, like, yeah, right. so, like you know I mean? that's my Saturday flow chart, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just that was free, but there's different filters uh, yeah. that we can that we can flow through here. Yeah, you know, and, and I think this is important. Like when you think about people who are just trying to find perfect and like no problems or no issues, here become here comes the difference that tends to be a cult. That's what a cult is, is when you're mm-hmm. trying to create perfect harmony and perfection and not have any difference in issues or problems. But culture is dealing with the right is dealing with the right people and having those issues. It's stepping into the hard times and dealing with those things in a way that everyone gets better and everyone grows and everyone transforms. When, when you're trying to get rid of the problems or the issues, that's a cult. And I think that's such yeah. a good balance between what a cult and culture really are. So this, like I, I think of, what was it? The Greatest Dance? Was that the documentary, the Michael Jordan documentary? Last Dance. Dang it. Greatest Dance. Was that what? <laughs> I was like, I think you got to be like the Greatest Showman. What was it like? Save the Last, the last Dance. <laughs> All right. So everyone realizes that I don't know what I'm talking about half the time, but there was a documentary with Michael Jordan called the last dance, the last dance. And in it, there were difficult people on that team in every way. They were a great team. Dennis Rodman. My goodness. We we all know he was a difficult person. Period. Poster child for being a difficult person. Yeah. Right. And yet, the the unity and connection and the way they all worked with one another they didn't just get rid of rodman they learned how to work through it in a healthy way kind of so but the point is like that created a better team dennis rodman when he got had his little getaway that was like horrible i think it was his next game back was the most unbelievable game he ever had yeah that's crazy and yet the team was better for it. And so I think as we get into these filters that Dustin's talking about, as we dig into it, these types of things are ways to deal with the difficult. And I think the first thing we've got to filter through is, is this a difficult person or is this just a difficult situation? Is this situation normal? Is this person who's responding this way is that the normal way that they respond this way? Or is something else going on that maybe I need to dig into a little because in order to have a good team in this moment and for us to work well together, we've got to excavate some stuff here. Or maybe I've done something and I just don't even know it. And I'm like, why is this person like giving me the cold shoulder? And why, why when normally I would ask them a question, I get like 10 paragraphs. And right now I ask something and their response is, okay. Right. It's like the office when Kelly was ticked at Jim and Dwight and she said something to it or he asked her a question and she was just like, OK. And Pam was like, that's weird. And he was like, what? It's like that. I mean, have you ever known Kelly to not respond about, you know, with 10 paragraphs here? Like what's what's going on? And so same thing, being able to ha- pick up on those things and understanding, is this a difficult situation or is this a difficult person? I think it's probably the first filter. Yeah, that's a great filter, too, because it's two different paths that you need to take, right? If it's a difficult person, then we can continue the conversation today about some different filters to continue to work through. If it's a difficult situation, that's a whole other thing. That's just problem management, right? That's just part of being a leader. That's just saying, okay, this is an issue that has arised, right? Like we have, if we're, if you're an EOS traction based business, you look at the issues list, right? This is just an issue for us to deal with. Um, and all the players involved are fine. It's just an issue at hand. It's just a, it's just a a, a different, it's not a personality, a person thing. It's a, a a structure, an organizational, a a logistical, you know, kind of thing. Uh, I think another one for you to, to think about too, uh, is you need to, I think before you really dive into the problem, I think we need to check ourselves. I think you need to check yourselves, uh, and ask yourself, are you empathetic towards this difficult person or are you angry 
at this difficult person mm. because those, those are two very different responses and those and those will likely bring two very different results mm. and i would i would challenge you that if you are angry with this person try some different emotional tactics to get yourself into a place where you're more empathetic than you are angry with them mm. because here's what's going to happen if you try to deal with a difficult person that you're angry with and you have more anger than empathy towards them. The only resolution for you is for you. Hmm. Does that make sense? What I'm saying the only resolution in that type of conflict and that type of dealing with a difficult person is just for your benefit. It's not yeah. for theirs. Yeah. If I can just get everything off my chest and say everything that I need to say, then I'll feel much better and I could care less how they feel. Hmm. We all know that feeling. We all know that thought. But once you're in it and you say the thing, what happens? You immediately feel like garbage. Right. You're like, well, that's not what I wanted to say. That's not how I wanted this whole thing to go. I certainly didn't want them to leave the room slamming the door or crying or, you know, like that's not how I wanted this to go. Yeah. Um, so you have to ask yourself, am I empathetic or angry towards them? And so I think you need to move yourself towards being empathetic. Um it's, it's, it's an emotional thing sometimes to deal with difficult people, especially if you're an emotional person, I'm an emotional person. Yeah. And so for me, there's different tactics of like, I have to, you know, kind of do some practice, some four square breathing, um, which is, you know, you breathe in for four seconds, you hold it for four seconds, you release for four seconds, and then you wait another four seconds and do it all over again. So things like that, uh, I think are, are, are tactics that you can take into this scenario to help better the outcome. Yeah. Because again, we said we don't want to be the type of like, we don't want to be a cult. We don't want to be the, the organization that just tosses people by the wayside. We're in the business of developing people. We're in the business of building great culture. And that means having the hard conversations. And so for me, oftentimes in my life, I get into a situation, I'm an extremely emotional person. I'll have to just kind of stop for a second, do the four square breathing, really kind of think through and move myself from anger to empathy in order to get the best resolution possible because that's what we're out here to do. Yeah, that's good. I, another thing that's real helpful here too is um, both setting and respecting boundaries. So when dealing with hard people and dealing with something that you're just not used to, um, realizing what puts them in a place that they respond in a hard way and what puts you in a place that you respond in a hard way. And like, is it that you're allowing this thing to happen to you all the time? Yeah. And that's a time to say, okay, I need to, I, I do have control over this. And that control is I need to set a boundary. And that boundary is when this person comes up to me, I'm working on my thing and they try to interrupt having some kind of response of, Hey, you know what? I need you, or I'm going to come right to you and I'll deal with this, but I got to get this done right now. And I'm, I'm on right. something right now. So being able to set that boundary, but then also nobody's going to respect boundaries you set if you don't also respect their boundaries. And I think a lot of times we end up having these emotional responses and hard situations because we're walking in and disrupting somebody's flow, disrupting somebody's time. And that's not always the case, but it can be. And I think sometimes we just need to see, I might be the cause of a lot of this, not just, oh, it's happening to me. I'm the victim. No, sometimes you know, we're the person kind of pushing this. Yeah. And I think if you're, if you're diligent, part of building a great culture is setting these boundaries like Blake is talking about. And if you set those boundaries at the onset, like if, as you're establishing uh, a new culture, or maybe you're in a brand new business and a brand new organization, and you're establishing these things for, kind of from the ground up, these are, these boundaries need to be a part of that culture that you're setting. Hey, we don't yell at each other. That's a boundary, mm. right? Um, we, praise publicly and criticize privately. Those are boundaries. 
right? Mm -hmm. You set those boundaries in place for a reason before the problems arise so that when they do arise and you do need to have a conversation, you know, okay, uh, in this conversation, we're not going to yell because we don't yell. It's part of our culture. Uh, In this conversation, it's going to be private, not public, because it needs to be a little critical and we're not going to do that in front of other people. Yeah. So these are things that you need to set uh, in place beforehand. Yeah, that's that's such a good point to make that we've got to have the cultural boundaries like we have core values we have the brand of who we are through the brand of who we are as an organization that's where that flows right those those cultural do's and don'ts of how the boundaries that we set because there are some organizations that like yelling is is part of it right like it's They're very passionate people who like on a, on a job site, we love yelling and we love messing around it, but there are boundaries and where is the boundary boundary is that never makes it to the customer. You know, like you, that never, you don't throw that at the customer. We're respectful in this way because they're not us, you know, and we've got to have that. So I love that point you just made there that we've got to have those cultural boundaries identified Maybe a lot of times at an organizational level, it is our fault as the leaders Mm -hmm. to not set those standards because we allow everything. So then how do you hold anyone accountable for anything when they do have an issue? When I rail off and, you know, maybe at home, my wife and I are way more Italian in the way we go back and forth at each other. But at the workplace, you know, and we're joking around and we're just talking loud that comes off as screaming at someone else and they break down and mm-hmm. their perception is their reality. So they go to HR and HR says, why did you yell at her? And then you're like, I, what? Like, no, I was just speaking yeah. passionately and loud. And talk. So being able to set those standards and understanding early is, man, that's so crucial. And yeah. that brings us to the next point of a lot of this is personality issues. It mm. isn't even just, um, that I'm yelling, my personality is way more extroverted. You go to an introvert and you start like right now I'm talking with a whisper. That's probably a scream to a lot of introverts and I need to be careful. And okay, how do I come about this? Do I speak more absolute or do I speak more in thoughts and questions of, I wonder ifs and personality issues. When I've looked at big issues that I've had organizationally between team members, um, And I'm like, I get each of them in a different room and kind of talk to them about the situation. And then I sit back and I'm like, they're saying the exact same thing. (laughs) They are, are, they're arguing the same point. Not like, Mm -hmm. Hey, is it Cinnabon versus Stormate? They're both on the same one. They're like, yeah, I love Cinnabon. And the other's like, yeah, but I love Cinnabon. And then we're not, we're missing that there's a personality issue on how they're going about the discussion. And so kind of what Dustin was saying earlier about um, like, are you trying to be right? Or are you trying to actually come to the solution, right? Are you being empathetic? Or are you just angrily trying to get to have your per- position seen as the winning position? A lot of times yeah. that just funnels to personality. Yeah. What are your thoughts I, yeah. I think leaders oftentimes think, well, there's only certain personality types that I want to surround myself with. And mm. that personality type is, you know, only winners right and went and they have this big kind of like idea in their mind of what a winner is looks like and how they act and how they talk and everything the problem with that is is that you have an extremely one-sided lopsided organization that is not well-rounded at all and most things that come your way you won't be able to deal with because you don't have the right personalities to deal with them and so Part of dealing with difficult people is understanding different personality types and accepting and having those different personality types on your team. Now, if they're just a difficult person because they just love conflict and they just love being difficult and they love playing, quote unquote, devil's advocate all the time, that might not be a a spot for them on the team. But let me just tell you this. When I run when I run brainstorms. uh, Brainstorm meetings, there are certain personality types that I have to have in the room. Yeah. And there are certain personality types that I absolutely cannot afford to have in the room. I have to have big dreamers who think big, but are really poor at execution hmm. in that room. That's I got to have them because they're going to have the best ideas because they're going to, they're not going to limit themselves on what it's going to take to actually get the idea done hmm. in the next meeting. 
when we're refining all of those ideas and we're talking about logistics and budget and time and energy and effort and right team and do we have all the things in place to actually get it done? I don't want those big dreamers in that meeting. Mm. I don't. What I want is the people that I didn't invite to the first meeting to come in who are going to be super critical of everything and mm. poke holes in it and say, this is why we can't do this because that's the time to, that's the, that's, that's the time that I need them the most. Yeah. So can they be critical? Yes. Can't do they, do they have to be critical of everything and have a poor attitude? That's a completely different story, but yeah. you can use a critical personality. And that's why it's so important. Like I know Blake and I study the Enneagram a lot along with like working genius and um, you know, Myers Briggs and all these different personality profile tests are super important because it allows you to understand the different makeup of people that you have on your team. And if you understand the makeup of people that you have on your team, when a problem arises, you know exactly how to communicate to that person, yeah. which is our next thing we're going to talk about, which is maybe it's not a personality issue. Maybe it's just a communication issue, yeah. which I think bleeds over a little bit, Blake, from personality into communication. Because if you don't know how this person receives information and how they speak information, which is their personality, part of their personality makeup, then it's, it's going to be like you're talking about earlier. They're both arguing for the same thing. Yeah. But they can't hear it because one's talking Spanish and the other one's talking French and neither one of them understand what the other one's saying. Yeah. Well, this is this becomes one of the bigger problems with leaders is a lot of times leaders, I mean, how often have you heard the quote, you know, I uh, business would be easy if it wasn't for the people. I, mean, I just oh, yeah. don't want to deal with people. You know, people, it, it's just the area that I'm weakest on. But where do 99% of the problems happen? They're, they're people issues. Mm -hmm. You don't want to study people, suck it up, get to it because this is where you have to deal with it in order to have an organization that thrives. So yes, going through Enneagram and studying personalities and understanding how people communicate sounds taxing. Who cares? Get over it, get to the work because when you do get to the work and you do find out how people tick, you're going to start piecing teams together better. And so when we're looking at communication issues, um, are you actively listening to people? Or are you just trying to like push through to get your point across? Because if you can actively learn how to people communicate and how people tick and how people think, you're going to become so much better, so much better at organizing teams and creating the team that is going to leave your lead your organization to a level you never thought possible but it will take studying people and that doesn't sound exciting all the time but i'm telling you it's it's getting the driver ready for the for the big race yeah yeah and there's i mean you know this because i mean listener i'm talking to you like you know this too but you you know that 99 percent of the problems that you deal with between two employees or yourself and another team member you know, at the end of it all, and you walk out of that meeting and someone goes, how'd the meeting go? What's your answer? I was just communication error. Yeah. Every, almost every time I would be willing to bet that statistic is the majority of the time that it's just a communication yeah. breakdown. Yeah. And so that's why it's important for you to have some established boundaries and some established SOPs and all these different ways of communicating uh, that everybody agrees with and uses because if they don't, that's where the breakdown happens. And then you're like, well, you're just being difficult. I'm, I'm just trying to communicate with you the way that we said when we hired you, we were going to communicate with you. Right. Um, or you told me you were going to communicate with me this way when you hired me. But I, that channel is blank. Yeah. You know, that avenue is 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 a dead zone because yeah. I'm not getting any clarity. I'm not getting. And so that's where it breaks down. And so sometimes the communication is uh, misinformative. Sometimes the communication is non-existent. Mm. Yeah. And that's where I think that's where we go back to checking, checking yourself a little bit at the beginning and going, OK, not only am I empathetic or angry, but it, do I have a role in this? Yeah. And owning and owning that first. There's nothing that can diffuse a personality situation more than owning your part of it first. Yeah. It's like the rules of negotiation. You're talking about uh, the office earlier, right? Uh -huh. and Michael Scott has all these dumb rules about negotiation, about changing places at the last minute or refusing to speak first. Or all yeah. this. this is one that I would say is absolutely a non-negotiable. You have to figure out where your fault is in it and be the first one to admit it. Yeah. 
I think it's also the best communication is probably one of the best places to start. If you're like, I don't, I need to get better at this people thing, but I don't know how. I think communication is one of the best places to start to go in and understand that just because you told someone, and I'm using air quotes there, mm-hmm. just because you told someone something does not mean you really told them. Okay. Mm-hmm. Communication, when it's at its truest form, is only true when you understand how the other person received it. Yes. The only time it's true is that you know that you know they understood it. Not that, I mean, anytime I'm like, hey, why did this break down? Everyone quickly goes to, I don't know. I told them this. Okay. Did you did take into effect that they've never done this before? Well, no. <laughs> well, you Then you were speaking with a lot of nuance that they didn't understand and telling mm-hmm. them things they had no context for. Do you see that yeah. that's not communication? That's just speaking. Very big difference. Communication is only true when you know how they understood what you said. Exactly. Because a lot of times we come in and, and we think well, we're, we're speaking this 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 language you need you need to, uh, that that people don't understand you need to understand that uh, most people in the world will not speak up and tell you i'm sorry i don't understand what you're saying right they won't do it nope. you won't do it i don't like it people don't like it. it's very uncomfortable because it automatically lowers their status down and what they perceive to be yeah. in your mind right and so mm-hmm. there's an opportunity here for you to be like and this isn't talking down to someone this isn't uh, uh, being, being degrading or demeaning. But I tell you, one of the best hacks in this is to ask people to repeat back to you what you said. Mm. It sounds super childish, but there's no better way for you to learn how they receive what you're saying. than if you have them spit it back out at you again and you go, Oh, that's what you heard. Okay. Let me just, I see how you probably interpreted what I said Mm -hmm. that way. Actually, actually what I meant. And you see how that extra 30 seconds can change everything and can really, really stop yourself from ever even getting to the point of having to deal with a difficult situation or a person. Mm -hmm. Well, and when you say, do you understand? (laughs) Like, okay, well, Hey, do you understand? Well, no. How about instead going, Hey, where do you need clarification? Mm, where do you great need question. clarification? Okay. Because clarification, asking for clarification doesn't sound like you don't know. It's making exactly. sure you're clear. Mm-hmm. That's good. That's a good tip. But um bum. Dow 1 800 culture base for more tips. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> I don't even know if that's the right amount of letters. Um, <laughs> man, this has been great. Uh, hopefully you've gotten some, uh, really good, uh, filters to think through when you're dealing with these difficult people, a lot of them before the situation arises, a lot of them in the middle of the situation and a lot of them follow through afterwards as well. So man, man, that is really, really good. I have not talked, uh, to Blake about what our next episode is, so I'm not going to plug it yet because I'm a little iffy on it, but I can tell you it's going to be a banger. Uh, (laughs) it's going to be, it's going to be hot coming out next Tuesday, uh, you're going to want to make sure you tune into that one because it's going to be legit. The culture based, how to make the perfect green bean casserole based based green bean casserole (laughs) that we'll do that one in November. Yeah, we'll do that one in November. Do you use French's onions or Mm. do you make your own Mm. because you're a foodie like me? Mm. No wrong answer there, by the way. No, there's not. The answer to green bean casserole is yes. And then you move on. Mm. So <laughs> I love it. Uh, I want to remind you my equal equal with green bean casserole. That was the best thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, I want to remind you, if you uh, would love to talk to us and have a free 30 minute strategy session, you can go to the culture click on the strategy button up there and fill out that form. And we will set up a call with you to get going on whatever it is that you need to help know where you're going and show where you're going and develop a scalable team to get you there. Blake, great day, man. Great day. I feel good about that one. It's a good Normally day. we'd have this conversation when the episode ends. I just feel like let's go ahead and have it right now. How do you feel like today went? That was really good. I feel like it was really good too. Yeah. Really good too. I like your shirt. Thanks. It's the kind of stuff we talk about afterwards. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Not really. Anyway, we'll talk to you guys next time on the Culture Base Podcast. <laughs>